So I'm very, very excited to welcome our next speaker to the stage. She's presently a PhD student, a PhD student at the MIT Center for Bits and Atoms, where she's working at the intersection of the physical and the digital. Um, I had the opportunity to connect with her just a few minutes before, and she's extremely passionate about open source and also making the digital fabrication and automation process a lot more accessible to people like you and I. Currently, she is developing a modular system for making machines that make, and she's going to share a lot more about what that process looks like for us and what the future can look like when we have that in our hands. So please join me in welcoming Nadia Peek. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. I am indeed Nadia Peek. Uh, can you hear me OK? Everything? OK. Cool. Um, so I'm at MIT in the Center for Bits and Atoms. Um, and first, I'm going to tell you a little bit just in general about the Center for Bits and Atoms and MIT. Um, and then I will transition to talk more specifically about digital fabrication, um, advanced manufacturing, and the infrastructure with which we build those kinds of things. Uh, and uh, are you guys, is it, are, are people here students? Or uh, if you raise your hand if you're a student. Lots of students. OK, cool. Um, and, and uh, so I'm, I'm actually Dutch, but I, I work at MIT now. Um, but I'm going to give this presentation in English. But if anyone has questions afterwards um, about first studying in the Netherlands, like I studied at the UvA, and then going to the US, then um, talk to me afterwards if you're interested. But anyway, now, for, without further ado, first I'll start with figuring out if the clicker works. OK. Um, so the Center for Bits and Atoms works in between the physical and the digital, which kind of just means to say we, we do whatever we want. Um, but most of the time, we're interested in how do you build things at a low level, and how does that scale up and change things um, in, in kind of systems? Uh, so for example, in this slide, there's like a house that's built out of modular parts. Um, next to that, on the head of a, of a quarter, there's tiny kinds of modular Lego. And this modularity thing, or snapping together different parts to be able to make bigger holes, is a, is a theme that is in, uh, in all of our work. Um, there's also different kinds of processor architectures and processor designs that we've been doing, also um, antennas. Um, but most of that I won't talk about it because it's not that exciting. Uh, <laughs> but uh, at the Center for Bits and Atoms, we have a, a lot of digital fabrication resources. Like We have a lot of equipment. Um, and the idea is that at any length scale, so at the meter size or at uh, the decimeter size or the centimeter size or the nanometer size, we can both measure something and then fabricate something. And so we have water jet cutters for um, making large things. We have, um, uh, we have focused ion beams for making very small things at the nanometer scale. Um, so we have all these different kinds of tools at our disposal. But... Um, they're really expensive and not necessarily that accessible. So one of the things that the Center for Bits and Atoms is kind of well known for is starting this idea of a shared set of tools and processes in a fab lab. So this is a fab lab which is in Vestminer in Iceland. Uh, there's another one at the Vach. There was someone from the Vach speaking earlier. And, and the idea there is that like a library, instead of buying all of the tools and having them in your home, instead of buying all the books and having them in your home, you can go to a centralized place and have access to something that maybe is not affordable at an individual level, but at a group scale becomes easier to access. And I'll come back to um, the Fab Labs in a second. But here, the idea here is that you have access to prototyping and fabrication tools at a low volume scale. So you're not a mass manufacturer. You're just an individual who might have very specific needs for a product. Um, and you're able to produce them in a, in a space like this. Uh, we also teach a class called Fab Academy, um, which is an analogy of a class that we also teach only at MIT called How to Make Almost Anything. Uh, and in that class, you learn how to make something with each one of the tools that you might have access to. Um, and I also teach a class after How to Make Almost Anything called How to Make Something That Makes Almost Anything, um, in which uh, you learn about machine building. So I'll talk more about that later, too. Um, and so one thing that the Center for Bits and Atoms is excited about, we, uh, is the difference between analog materials and digital materials. And so if you think of the way the 3D printers that are out there or milling machines work, um, they're removing, you have code that controls a machine and you're removing things, 
Um, but that stuff that you're controlling is like mush. You're just kind of like moving mush around. Um, whereas if you think about what a child can do with assembling Lego, Lego bricks, when you fit them together, have about five micron precision. And a child doesn't have five micron precision, but because of the design of the brick of Lego, there's error correction in the assembly process. So a child can do something very precise because of the intelligent way the parts are designed. And similarly, if you think about you as humans, you know, we're made out of amino acids that fit together in clever ways and can also be broken down in clever ways and reused as food or fuel for other things. And so is there a way in which we could have this analogy of digital materials um, instead of analog materials in the way we construct things that we also consume as products. Um, so these are all different sizes of things that we've prototyped at the Center for Bits and Atoms that, uh, that, that um, use that analogy. So some of them are, uh, some of them are uh, kind of robotic scale. So this is, uh, you can see on the here, this is, a, uh, this is a folding string, which is kind of maybe this size. Uh, and uh, this here is a folding string, which may be this size, and then I get bigger. And so the idea is that you can reconfigure these digital blocks to be any kind of different matter or material. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different ways in which we've prototyped this as a material. This is a carbon fiber struts. So we work with Airbus with the idea of, can we make airplanes out of these digital materials? It sounds kind of crazy when you say, OK, yeah, let's make airplanes out of Lego instead of making airplanes out of whatever you already make airplanes out of. But this kind of reconfigurability also entails a kind of repairability and reusability um, that, uh, that, that's quite powerful. And actually, uh, this structure, um, this digital material, exhibits really, really good material properties that you can then also tune for different specific tasks. Uh, uh, which then uh, we published in uh, we published about in Science, which is it's 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 like the world's stiffest ultralight material made for building and uh, made for building these airplane wings. And then we also um, extended the analogy out to the skin of the airplane wing. So that's also again made up out of these modular bricks and modular parts. Uh, and then not only for um, carbon fiber, but also also other kind of bulk materials and other kinds of uh, other kinds of parts, we've been building uh, uh, assemblers that assemble these. So you don't necessarily want to just employ children to assemble your Lego for you. That would be slave labor. And, uh, and so instead, how can we design assemblers and assembler robots that assemble these materials for you? Um, and so here's one that, for example, works for electronics. This is for making 3D uh, interconnects for, for example, circuit boards. So there are people here that are um, soldering circuit boards by hand, but what if you could just program it to be assembled by one of these assembly machines? So uh, here is a, uh, or here's some, some work that we've been doing on the uh, analysis of, of, of the bulk property, because whenever you have a connection in electronics, that's not necessarily that good, um, because that's a point of failure. So how can you, uh, how can you have a point of connection uh, that's reliable? That's uh, another part of our research topic. Um, and, uh, ooh. I missed a video. Where'd it go? Hmm. Hopefully not all my videos are missing. Uh, I tested the presentation, I promise. But all right, so that's kind of like where I work at the Center for Bits and Atoms. We have lots of fancy machines. We build all this modular stuff. And we're really into modularity as a way of constructing materials in the future. But now let's go back, 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 way back to um, the ENIAC. So who knows about this computer? couple of people, right? So it was originally developed as a computer for wartime effort, right? They're, they're like, OK, we want to uh, target these enemies over there, and we want to calculate what the missile trajectories and what the firing tables are going to be um, to be able to target those enemies. So this is a big government investment to create a digital computer um, to be able to have military force. However, Quickly, it was repurposed, or the same technology was repurposed by Apple, by Xerox PARC, um, to create personal computers. And so we went from having digital computers to personal computers in, over the time span of maybe 25 years, which is a pretty, uh, pretty quick kind of reduction to practice. Um, and then the computers no longer are being used for things like military firing tables, but now for things like desktop publishing um, and uh, Facebook. But 
the analogy in uh, digital fabrication doesn't necessarily, or I would argue that it does not necessarily hold quite as well. There's a, this is a, uh, this is a CNC mill, a large format CNC mill uh, in a factory that's doing um, prototyping of airfoil shapes. And so here you have a, a room size CNC machine, so you can, you can move the top part back and forth, you can move in and out of this room, and you can move up and down, and you're moving this milling head around. Um, and so this is like a large machine, and it costs around a million dollars. And then here's a smaller version of the same thing that uh, is the same one that is in the Fab Lab, for example, in Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, this one is more like two meters wide and, uh, well, 1.3 meters wide and maybe two and a half meters long. Um, and, you're, and you're programming kind of the same motion. Uh, and then you have even smaller and smaller versions. So one of the ways that uh, digital fabrication kind of is commoditizing is by making the tools uh, smaller and therefore cheaper. Um, but while we're making them smaller and cheaper, they're also becoming less precise. They can't necessarily do the same things that larger, uh, that larger tools can do. And so one thing that I would criticize in terms of the Fab Lab makerspace approach is if you go up to a mainframe computer and you want to run a calculation, you run the calculation, you get an answer, and you get that answer pretty quickly. You want to run the same calculation on your personal computer, it might take much, much longer amount of time, but you're going to get the same answer. It's not going to be a smaller, less precise answer. Um, and so if we want to be able to make low volume digital fabrication accessible to a, broad, um, to a broad audience, you need to have those people have the same access to precision and complexity that the big players have. And that's not exactly happening necessarily in these kinds of places. If you have really small 3D printers that print things out of plastic, um, then you're going to be able to make a lot of small things out of plastic. But most of the things that we use in our day-to-day -day lives are not small things that are made out of plastic. And so how are we going to change um, those means of production? Um, but yes, it is, uh, like, I think that we can attack this problem from many different plate ways. Th these, are two, uh, these are two machines that were kind of spun off of designs from the Center for Bits and Atoms. There's also um, Ultimaker, which is, came out of Protospace. There's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of cool, cheap, accessible machines. And this is improving access to digital fabrication. But that's not the access that I want to talk about with you guys today. I specifically, uh, there's a few other things I want to mention about how this is actually pretty cool. There's the Glowforge laser cutter. Maybe you guys have seen it. Has anyone seen this one online? It's, uh, the thing that's cool about this is it's still a cheaper uh, laser cutter that has a 35 or maybe 45 watt laser instead of maybe a 100 or 200 watt laser. Um, but they're product design is not a smaller version of an industrial machine. Their product design is considering you as a user being a novice or not necessarily an expert in lasers. So you can go up and draw something on your material and it'll cut it out for you. You don't necessarily have to design it in CAD ahead of time. Uh, and also Onshape, for example, is a browser-based version of SolidWorks. Does anyone ever use SolidWorks? Rhino? Yeah, SolidWorks on Rhino. Uh, so SolidWorks is kind of annoying to install, and they have like a license server that you have to run, and maybe you can steal it, although that's illegal, so we don't encourage that. Um, but Onshape is a different model, which is kind of more like GitHub. So they're the same founders who originally started SolidWorks, but instead of uh, instead of doing um, a uh, instead of doing a, a program that runs on Windows only to do CAD. Um, this is a browser-based CAD program where as long as all of your designs are open source, you can have them up there for free, or at least I think up till five. But if you want to have secret or private designs, then you have to pay a subscription, just like GitHub. Um, and then uh, this is a project that we've been working on at the Center for Bits and Atoms. So instead of having to do CAD and CAM, so you design, you design the part in, uh, SolidWorks or Grasshopper or whatever you want to design it in. And then you have to create a toolpath for the machine. So there's the thing that you designed. And then there's the toolpath that the machine has to take to make the part that you designed. And uh, that's an, another piece of software that can be kind of annoying to use. So we're trying to make it easy so that everybody can, no matter what machine you're using, you can use the same interface from CAD to CAM to your machine control. Um, and I'll talk about that more maybe later. Um, 
But uh, just to reiterate, this is, how many of you guys have Max? Not the majority, that's good. <laughs> Max, Max are kind of cool because they have, they're made in these, not this part, they're made in these uh, uh, factories where they're using CNC milling machines. And so each one of these unibody uh, Max is, uh, is milled with one of these milling machines that we also saw earlier in the slideshow. Um, and uh, it's not really necessary because they make a million units a year, so they might as well make a mold and injection mold everything. Um, but if you want to injection mold, if you have a plastic laptop, typically there's like a big metal mold that then plastic is forced into, and you make many of the same things. It's the same way Lego is made, same way Barbies are made. Um, but that mold, the metal mold, takes a long time to make because you have to mill that mold. Um, and so instead of milling the molds, Apple is milling the product. Uh, and that's cool because they could make each product totally different. Um, they would change the code a little bit, and then you could have your laptop be slightly wider or slightly higher or have like a picture of your best friend in it. Uh, except that they don't do that. They're actually just making exactly the same products over and over again. But it's good for their own business agility that when they want to change their product slightly, so if they do make the iPhone, what is it now, 8, 7? that if they make it slightly bigger or smaller, then they can change code and then deploy that on all of their milling machines and immediately change over their factory produ production line without having to wait for making these molds for injection molding. So that's good for them, but it's not necessarily, uh, it doesn't necessarily, like they can still employ, they could still employ several, uh, they could still employ several engineers like me to optimize that code to product process. And that part is not just immediate. You test things and, and, uh, and, and so maybe it'll take a week for them to get it exactly right. But if you're someone who wants to make only one of something or maybe 10 of something, you don't necessarily want to spend a whole week with a team of 10 prototyping the production process. And so even though this is a, uh, even though this is a, uh, uh, a a technique that is used for low volume production. The only reason, or the only reason I can really tell that Apple is using it is because this low volume manufacturing process has connotations of luxury because low volume is typically very expensive. Um, and so, but it's a lie because they can optimize it in the same way that all other mass manufacturing gets optimized. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, this milling machine, so this one is at NASA, uh, some of our collaborators are now, sorry, my hair keeps hitting this microphone. Uh, some of our collaborators are now at uh, NASA, and this is a milling machine that they have there to make low volume aluminum parts, just like the MacBook, but also parts out of titanium, which is cooler than aluminum. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty, it's a, a robust and really nice milling machine. However, you know, the way that you run it, it's like this interface where the place where you plug in your USB stick still says load tape. Like there's not a lot of development here in making this a better user experience. And so, yes, like the Glowforge laser cutter is easier to use, but if I want to make something out of titanium that I can then send to space because I have like a specific satellite project that I want to work on, um, this is not exactly a smooth learning curve for me to be able to embark on. And what's even worse is uh, that milling machine this is an article that came out in 1952 about the first computer hooked up to a milling machine to do computer numeric control of a milling machine. And this, uh, this milling machine is the same milling machine as this one from NASA. So in the past 60 years, there's been actually no innovation there. Uh, and so look, there are, you know, I don't know if at campus party, there have been other like factories of the future talks. And it's a, it's a very popular, it's like kind of hip topic right now, advanced manufacturing, factories of the future. And you have these robot arms, which are arguably pretty cool, um, where you could do like force control. So the worker who's working with this robot arm um, can work with it safely because it knows if it's pushing against something, not just, it doesn't only know where it is, it also knows how much force it's applying there. Um, and you can change you can change this end to be any end effector that you want. So if you wanted it to be welding, or if you wanted it to be painting, or if you wanted it to be doing different kinds of things, you just kind of change it out and it's reconfigurable, which is theoretically what we need. But in practice, uh, and we do, a, so this is like a 3D print head that uh, me and a collaborator, James, 
put at the end of this robot arm. But in, uh, in practice, actually, if you're really trying to do something quickly, um, this is a Saturday night at MIT, and we're, this, these are some architecture students who are hanging out, and they want to make like a complex surface out of styrofoam. Um, and they're using Rhino uh, and Rhino Cam to be able to create this kind of undulating wall surface, uh, which is kind of being cut out here out of styrofoam. Uh, and then they have this hot end, uh, which, is, uh, which is going to be cutting into that styrofoam. Uh, and uh, controlling that end effector with the rest of this robot system um, it's kind of complicated. You have, to, you have to plug it into this control network, and uh, it, doesn't, um, it, doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really afford itself to you quickly just being like, oh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add this little bit of code to, do, to add another end effector. And so actually, to make it easier for themselves, because this was just like a weekend project and not serious multi-semester research, they have this guy standing over here, and he's actually holding a surge protector. He's turning it off and on, so he's checking to see if it's getting too hot, just visually, and then he's turning it off and on. So in terms of like deep learning and AI and problems that we can solve, like keeping something at the right temperature is very easy. But if the problem is that it's so hard to integrate into the existing systems that it's just easier to put something extremely expensive in the loop, like a human being, then we're not doing something very well in our infrastructural development. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of the way that hardware has been designed all along up until now. When something breaks, you kind of throw the whole unit away and you get a new unit. Um, and reusability in hardware, therefore, is really complicated. You also sometimes don't necessarily know what breaks. Unlike in code, you can't put a breakpoint, you can't put like a print statement. Um, and so, uh, and so this, this modularity uh, metaphor doesn't necessarily lend itself that well. But, uh, I'm going to kind of, this is definitely a problem, but now let's go on another little journey. No, this time not into the history of the ENIAC computer and how we got to digital computation as we know it, but now we're going on a little journey to Shenzhen in China. How many of you guys have been to Shenzhen? Nobody? One person? <laughs> okay, cool. And so this is a, uh, this is a marketplace. Uh, each one of these little stalls, one, two, three, four, each one of these little stalls is a place where you can buy some electronic components or maybe some mechanical components. So I can go up and say, I want a potentiometer, or I want an LED, or I need this microcontroller, or even I want this motherboard for this kind of cell phone. And the cool thing about this is not only that it's like a marketplace where you can buy things, but also that each one of these little stalls represents a whole factory. So as soon as I go up there and I say, I want five of this potentiometer, and then I make it into a product which is successful, and then I come back and I say, now I want 50,000 of this potentiometer, it's kind of the same space to go to. This is, of course, really a cool place for people like me to hang out because I like building things. This is where you can get stuff to build things. And you can think of it maybe as an analogy to a place where you could get libraries if you're a software programmer. So you import libraries that then you can reuse for different things. Here's a marketplace full of modular components that you can use for electronics. Um, and the way that Shenzhen is mostly famous for being the location of Foxconn. So if you have a Samsung phone or an iPhone, um, they're manufactured there. So all of those components are kind of floating around. Um, and so they do manufacturing for hire. Um, but they don't only do that. They actually also come up with their own products. And so I have a hobby, or like a, I collect these cell phones that are designed and made in China. So these are some, some of my favorites from the collection. For example, here you can see my Prashi Lamborghini dual SIM golden die cast metal necklace cell phone. Uh, here is like the Disney or doll pig. This is a, an Hermes handbag cell phone. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is an iPhone, I think it's called the iPhone 10, uh, and it's about half the size of a normal iPhone, and it's, uh, it runs Android, which is skinned to look like iOS, um, and it costs about $20. Uh, and, it, and, and, and it has actually a lot of functionality that iPhones don't have, like it's dual SIM because you might be working in Hong Kong and in China, um, it has interchangeable batteries. There's all these kind of features and functions that just get added in in case you need them. Um, and they're kind of tacky, right? None of these products are like, wow, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. But 
The cool thing about them is none of these phones are intended for high volume manufacture. Like none of the people that designed this thought, oh, I'm going to scale and like disrupt Apple. Uh, they're all like, oh yeah, you know, like it's easy enough. We have the means of production here. We have all of these different components here that we marketplace that we have access to. And so we can just kind of goof off and play around and make all of these different products, which we don't intend for high volume sales. They're just kind of low volume, fun, gimmicky toy phones, which are still relatively technologically complex. Like to be able to integrate uh, an air maze skin into your mobile phone's operating system, as well as make the PCB fit into that enclosure, as well as uh, make the entire phone itself mechanically. Those are, that's like a relatively high level of system integration to make these things. Um, and so if we can have this level of techno daydreaming kind of production of stuff um, in things that aren't necessarily as frivolous as phones, um, but maybe address other kinds of needs, then that would really be great. Um, so how can we have that kind of production, or how can we have that kind of marketplace infrastructure in hardware um, in the same way that maybe you see it in software? So to, to recap, you know, we, we, we had the ENIAC computer, and then we got the personal computer. And now personal fabrication is uh, kind of uh, in this library fab lab accessibility scale. But going forward, um, can we make it so that it's much easier and we don't necessarily end up all in factories like this or with phones that are all exactly the same, but we can have uh, like a rich ecosystem of technologies that then can, uh, can be more um, democratic or, or meet the needs of, of individuals specifically. And so there's, a, uh, there's another historic artifact of why, you know, why all of these digital fabrication tools are the way they are. If you think back in history, each one of these people um, is a, it's like a different profession. So I could be the designer, the person who makes the objects, or I could be the toolpath planner, the person who, uh, who calculates these things, or I could be the person who does uh, the robot kinematics and figures out what all of the joint angles of the arm is, um, or I could be the machinist, the person who is executing on all these things. And what isn't necessarily considered so much anymore that these people might all be the same person, and I might be changing my mind constantly about what it is that I'm making or what it is that I need. Um, and so instead of thinking about digital fabrication as the thing that we're producing, um, I'm going to take you through a series of machines that thought about a thing that they were making and then made machines in service of that. I hope. Okay. So when we look at all of the machines that we're about to look at, think about you know, what is the tool head? What is the end effector? So in the case of that robot arm, there was a hot end that was cutting into a surface. Um, and uh, what is the way that you're using it? Uh, and then in between those two things, so with the robot arm, you know, you programmed it in a high-level programming language like RhinoScript, um, and you're moving a hot end around. And then in between those layers, there's like a mechanical system. So there's some kind of there's some kind of uh, guide shaft or rails that the, the motion is moving along. Um, there's some kind of uh, there's some kind of motor or sensor and actuator that's moving it. And then there's some kind of control system. So it's something to keep in mind. And uh, you know, this is an uh, open source small milling machine that I made many years ago. <laughs> um, which, for to be able to make it, you had to do all of these different disjoint things. Like you have to write microcode, you have to design the, um, you have to design the uh, 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 control boards, you have to uh, you have to design the frame. And so, also think about what all the different skill sets are that you need if you want to make or run these kinds of tools. So to start out with. This is uh, uh, one of my collaborators, James Coleman's architectural ceiling that he installed in Spain at some point. Uh, so uh, it looks kind of like a rendering, but it's, uh, it's not. It's, uh, these are all cardboard tubes that are hung at different heights uh, on the ceiling. And so to be able to create this surface, he needed to have all of these pieces of string that were exactly the right, exactly the right length um, for uh, uh, exactly the right length for for creating this uh, kind of Gaussian distribution surface. And instead of uh, sitting there and measuring out string for, uh, for days and days while they're doing this installation, um, he decided to make this string measuring cutting machine. Uh, yeah, I have a problem. All of my videos seem not to be running. <laughs> um, and the, uh, uh, so this, this machine basically like rolls all of the, uh, 
rolls all of the string up onto a popsicle stick, um, and then cuts it, and they're labeled so that when he so showed up on site in Madrid where the ceiling was, he had this box full of popsicle sticks with the numbers, so he knew exactly where they had to go, um, and he hung all of the cardboard, and the people that hired him to make the ceiling thought it would take him a two-week installation time, but instead he did it in uh, a day, and then he was on vacation in Madrid for the rest of the time. Uh, and so I have a video of it, but my videos aren't working, which hopefully will get resolved momentarily. Um, and here's another, uh, here's another machine. So this is a, uh, this is a loom, um, and uh, it's for making friendship bracelets by another one of my collaborators, Alain Moyer. Um, and to be able to make this loom, does everybody know what a loom is? Yeah, so it's for weaving things. And so to be able to, if you want to weave things that have different patterns in it, you have to pick up different of the threads at different times so that the thread passes under and over and, um, at different, um, at different uh, places in your fabric. And so to be able to do that, up here, there are all these electromagnets to selectively hold on to different strings as it's picked up and put down. Um, and each one of those electromagnets is like a, is like a 50 ohm, um, it's like a coil that you can turn on and then it holds on to it, or you can turn it off and then it doesn't hold on and you can weave in different ways. And uh, to be able to make all of these coils, you know, you could try to wind it by hand, but it has to all be exactly 50 ohms. And how do you get that kind of precision? Well, um, to be able to make that weaving machine, Alan made this other coil winding machine. Is it okay? <laughs> Oh, no, it's a, there's a keynote. There's two. I gave them a keynote. Ah, I thought this would happen. The key, the keynote, uh, doesn't work. But he tested it. Then can I get him no, to... We have to? Then we have to switch everything off. So that's, that's okay, because if I don't have the videos for the second half of the presentation, it's going to be very boring. Uh, I'm going to try it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there, the keynote, he tested the keynote before. Mm, okay. Sorry. Uh, so anyway, so if I had videos, I would show you a very cool video of it winding the coils very precisely. Uh, and so you don't have to necessarily do it by hand. And this idea is that instead of you thinking, oh, um, it's going to take me this amount of time to wind each one of these coils by hand, so I'm just going to do it and get it done. Instead, you're like, oh, I could make a machine that does this for me, and then I could have as many coils as I want whenever I needed them. Uh, and one way that you make this, uh, that you can make it easy to make machines is by making it easy to make stuff. So Fab Labs make it easy to laser cut things. This coil winder is basically five pieces of laser cut plastic and two motors. Um, but then how do you control those motors to do what you need them to do? And so uh, this is a networked control system that I developed together with Alain for uh, instead of every time you're designing a new piece of hardware, you have to make a, new, uh, a whole new brain for your machine, you just add another node onto the network. And so this is a, that's the way that like, a, a cluster would work if you wanted to do um, high-performance computing computation. Yeah? Did they have the videos? No, no, because there's a PDF. So I have them a PDF and a folder full of videos and a keynote that has the slides and the videos in it. Yeah, they're also separate. And I can tell them. <laughs> you don't have that? Can I give it to you on a USB stick? I have it. One second. <laughs> Check, check. 
All right. So here's what we're going to do. In the nature of technology, sometimes things happen. Nadia has some special videos in her presentation that we're going to get loaded up for you. In the meantime, I'm sure some of you have some very curious questions that you may want to ask right now. So we're going to start a little Q&A until we get it started off. I'm going to hand you the catch box. So if anyone has any questions that are tweaking in their mind right now that you'd like to ask, um, feel free to fire them away and we'll toss the catch box out to you while we get the videos loaded up. Um, I do have like one question okay. already as yeah. you're sharing how you're developing these things. What's your vision for how we'll be able to access these tools? Uh, that's really what the second part of the All right, I can't. I'm, I'm unveiling the, the good stuff. <laughs> no, not but uh, I think that uh, if you think of machine building infrastructure as something that is currently accessible to like um, expert engineers, yeah. I'm trying to make the infrastructure. I'm trying to change machine building infrastructure so that it's more broadly accessible yeah. without necessarily dumbing down the machines. Got it. What made you so passionate about wanting to explore this? Like there seems to be a, a, a deep fire <laughs> burning for this. So what, what's the well, why behind that? I guess uh, you know uh, I was uh, I was a student here in the Netherlands and I uh, I was actually in art school. Um, and, and not an engineer. And I, I went to Delft and I, to the open day when I was in high school, and it was like all guys, and they like were talking about cars, and I was like, oh, I really don't care. <laughs> uh, and so how do you, ha and, and then only much later, I ended up at MIT, and I was like, okay, there are a lot of ways that I want to participate with technology. Um, and when I was younger, I was like, I'm not a voice that matters, or like as a young person, I was like, I'm not a voice that matters in this space. Um, which I think is really problematic because if we only have guys making tech, then I'm mean, going to end up with what we have now, which is obviously terrible. <laughs> so any, any women who are students out there, can I get a, a show of hands? Any women students in the... I love that you... You can raise it high. It's okay. Yes. Um, how many of you are using digital fabrication in your work right now and prototyping? Show of hands. Yes. Can you share what you're using it for? Do I give them this box? How good is your arm? I don't know. Okay, uh, not, not great aim. Do I throw it at these people? Yeah. Throw it to the woman who was raising her hand. It's I love that soft. you're ducking already. It's, it's soft and plushy. Woo. Yes. That's exactly what it's for. Pass it. <laughs> um, share your name and, and what you're doing in your work right now. Uh, so my, my name is Martina. And uh, I'm not a student, but um, we uh, at work, we're using a 3D printer to make prototypes for research projects that we're working on. Cool. Awesome. What well, kind of? Yeah. Do you exactly. want to tell us more about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we're working on a project that uh, involves people with dementia and how to um, stimulate their um, memories. Yes. How to prototype things that can show personal memories or memories from the time when they were young. Very cool. Wow. Incredible. It's definitely low volume. One person's memories. What's that? It's definitely a low volume problem. It's only one person's memories. That's, that's incredible. How are we doing, Richard? Good. All right, anyone else? I saw another. Was that your hand that you wanted to share? You were just reaching in your pocket. Okay, got it. <laughs> Toss it back up. Man down. Is anyone else using digital fabrication or automation in their work? A show of hands. I love that. Now that you know, I'm going to throw it to you. No hand has gone up now at this point. We're going to get things back up in just a second. Um, I'd love to hear from you. I'm tossing it back to you. Yep. Okay. What made you come to this session? All right. You know, um, it's interesting to me as a woman, an mm -hmm. older woman, let's just say, uh, watching technology develop since I was a child and so many things are still missing that I think many women have uh, thought about for generations. Like, where is my family wall? You know, I know that sounds really corny, but I remember talking to women in the 80s who were saying, oh, we'll have a wall in our houses where we can sit and have dinner with our families all over the world. And as somebody with family all over the world, I'm like, where's my wall? Yeah, yeah. I want it. That would be pretty cool. I can toss it back. Let's see if I can catch with one hand. All right, guys, it's your turn. And you're giving me the look, so I'm passing it to you. Yeah, you, and you held your hands all before it. Awesome. What's your name and what are you working on right now? Um, I'm Robin Smallenbroek. That means small pants in Dutch. <laughs> 
So, um, small pants? I'm, I'm and, also, yeah, I'm, and you're wearing small I'm pants? I'm wearing them. This yeah. is excellent. Um, it, <laughs> I'm, I'm working uh, now on uh, something totally different, a project on democracy. I'm trying um, to make uh, the big discussions, uh, um, societal discussions, open for everybody in society. So nice. it's something completely different, but at the same time, my friend is now in America at Silicon Valley. He's, he's working hard to get his own PhD on, uh, yes, something with AI and fuzziness and creativity. So I, look, I, want, I came here just for him, just to maybe speak to her afterwards uh, about getting a PhD in America. So that's why I'm here. Very nice. I'm going to hold, you're going to hold it, you're going to pass it to someone new. Who wants it? <laughs> As every arm is tucked. Yes, if it lands in your lap, it's on you. Okay, it's me, I'm lucky. I'm here just to broaden my horizon. I have a background in aeronautical engineering, and I know how difficult it is to make uh, Air Force Air worlds. And to see a 3D printer work like this, I think you can make new uh, air wings and um, make them more efficient. So I'm, good to, I'm, I'm glad to be here and see uh, innovative stuff. Excellent, excellent. Does anyone else here have experience in 3D printing and have, has created or built things? I love that. You probably have it. You just won't raise your hand. That was great. You can pass it on to someone new. And I won't have anyone else share. After that, we'll get the tech back up and going. A Play-Doh machine, Play machine definitely counts. Play-Doh is like, Play-Doh is life. Hello, I'm uh, Rick Schoenbeek. I'm a, I'm a new uh, mechanical engineering student. Awesome. So, I'm, I'm here because I'm looking for ways that I can, uh, in the future, uh, use my, the knowledge that I'm gonna, gonna be learning. And I wanna know what I wanna, what I wanna learn and what I wanna use my, uh, yeah, what I wanna use my knowledge for. So it sounds interesting, uh, this idea of how to build, uh, how to build machines in a smart way. That's, yeah. yeah, it sounds really interesting to me. But I, I'm, I have not, not much experience yet with, uh, with, um, with chip machines. Excellent, so you came to learn a little more today. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm going to ask that you all bear with me. You don't have to toss it around another second. Um, our next talk is going to be in 15 minutes. If you just give us another five, I'm going to figure out where we are with tech, and we'll be right back on. All right? Thank you. Sorry, uh, I'm going to continue, hopefully from where I left off, and now be able to show you all your videos in a very abbreviated, faster version. So in this kind of dark room, we'll have more high energy, maybe. All right, so the apologies about uh, the frame rate. Here is that, then, uh, oh, my knicker do these. Men, the, they have to switch over the. What's that? What's that? Okay. Okay. Uh, I just to fair gaan alleen.
Hé, hey, maar kan ik dit gebruiken? Well, one of the things that I'm about to show you, which is much more exciting, which is much more exciting if I describe it in images than if I only describe it in words. But uh, the question, uh, the question is, what does it, what does infrastructure look like if you change it so it's newer? Okay, cool. What does infrastructure look like if you change it so that it's product-based instead of infrastructure-based? Or what if the tools all kind of look different? So the next uh, thing that I want to show you guys um, is, uh, is kind of a, a prototype that I made with Alon, who uh, also made this um, loom, of what it would look like if uh, you took a fab lab, but instead of it being a fab lab, like a library that you went to, it instead was a um, like a briefcase or a laptop. So instead of having a mainframe computer that you go to, you have a laptop like you guys are using now. Um, two days ago. It's not me, I swear. <laughs> and so. Oh yeah. Is it? Okay. Okay, come. Okay, so this is the coil winder, which I already talked about. So maybe you can go to the next slide with the next thing. Can you now Um And so we talked about this. So next, next again. And then this is a video. I'll play this video. Uh, and so this is the brief, so this is a kind of this reimagining of, imagine all of the tools that you're using in a fab lab, like a laser cutter and a 3D printer um, and a vinyl cutter, were all in one tool instead. So uh, one kind of funny thing about uh, this machine is that uh, uh, I prototyped it on a water jet. Um, and so I guess it looks enough like a Mac, or it's like made mostly out of aluminum, that when I go through airport security, they don't even ask me any questions. They just think it's a laptop. So they never open it. They never ask. So, and, uh, so this is a, it's kind of a cool motion platform because the, motor, the motors are stationary um, and the head is, uh, only moves up and down. So you can move very quickly and have a relatively large build volume um, even though, uh, even though it's, a, it's, a, it's a very compact and folding thing. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so here it is configured as a milling machine. Um, and so what if your infrastructure wasn't, I'm going to a factory, but I'm sitting outside, and when I need a new circuit board, uh, I just make it on demand. Next slide. Um, and so this is, these are all machines that either I made or students of mine have made in the class how to make something that makes almost anything. So this idea that you can prototype with rapid prototyping tools to make more rapid prototyping tools is relatively powerful. However, um, what if not only the control, so the, the thing that uh, is kind of salient about that uh, briefcase multi-purpose machine is that there is network control, so every time you change from a milling machine head to a 3D printer head, you have to change the electronics, and those are networked. But the device itself is still rigid. So if you go to the next slide, I know you're going to do several, several pretty quickly. So what if we just did mechanical motion um, as one module, and if you go to the next, um, or XY motion or XYZ motion, uh, or four axis motion where we're going up and down and back and forth. Um, this is kind of like modular mechanical parts as well as modular controls as well as modular software. So now uh, this is a, it's kind of the idea of using the analogy of software, object-oriented software, um, instead of uh, only in software, also using that in hardware so that you have this kind of modularity and reconfigurability in tools that you can use for digital fabrication. Next slide. So this is a video, so play the video. And so this is a, a prototype that I made with uh, James Coleman, uh, where 
you can reconfigure all of these different modules to make, uh, uh, to make these machines. So here, it's configured to be a, a, a hot wire cutter with four axes. So you can cut, for example, a circle on one side and a, uh, and a uh, square on another to create kind of complex shapes. Um, this is uh, the network control system. And here are all the modules stacked up together. Um, and this is the machine working together. So next slide. Or you can just go ahead. Um, and uh, that one we were using to cut hot foam. This is a, uh, I won't talk about this project. Next slide. Or you can show this. So this is a morphing wing. Um, but this is an experiment that we were doing in a wind tunnel. And uh, when we did the experiment, we forgot that we also need the baseline. So if you go to the next slide, um, we needed to build uh, a non-morphing version of the same wing so we could collect data on the morphing wing as well as a static wing. So we assembled um, different modules to build this up to make this uh, baseline test. So we made the machine as well as the wings as well as collected the data all in one day. So if you want to talk about low volume, rapid production, for things like this, making a machine to make a thing to then collect the data all together, it's kind of the speed that you want to be going at. Next slide. Um, but you guys don't have these metal modules. You maybe don't have a water jet cutter. So instead of uh, just, uh, instead of making, uh, uh, instead of trying to like, sell those modules, instead, uh, James and I designed a cardboard construction kit for exactly the same thing. So this is laser cut cardboard parts um, that you can then reconfigure to make all of these different kinds of machines. Um, so this is a video that's uh, showing how we, how we taught this machine building um, in Fab Academy. Um, so here I'm cutting all the way through the cardboard as well as scoring the cardboard. So here you're taking advantage of the precision of the uh, laser cutter and using it to create a very rectilinear box. Um, and then here again are the network controls. And then the idea is that each one of these axes takes you maybe, if you're a novice, maybe 45 minutes to put together. And then in uh, maybe, uh, so that maybe in an afternoon, you could have five axes that you could configure in different ways, add different end effectors to be able to build lots of different kinds of machines. Uh, there's more to that video. <laughs> Next time, maybe I should use the computer. So we'll watch the beginning again. <laughs> um, and so the people that use these uh, kits and built machines have never built machines before. They're all novices. And cardboard might seem like a kind of frivolous material to make a machine out of. But in a way, you know, cardboard is the ultimate modular material because there's no one that is confronted with a piece of cardboard and says, I have no idea how to modify this. Like, I, I, I don't know how to drill a hole in this. Any child will say, OK, I'm going to cut, or I'm going to glue an extra part onto it, um, or, I'm going to, uh, or I'm going to add things in different ways. So it's a, a very modifiable uh, tool. Um, and so here are now some of the examples of machines that, uh, that people have made. Um, so one of the, this is, uh, this is just how the stages move. There's a lot of people that made kind of painting machines or drawing machines. Um, this is a 3D scanning machine. So they have their iPhone taking pictures and the object moving to do photogrammetry. This is a coffee stirring machine. Um, this is a kind of a light show machine. But this is a five axis um, hot wire cutting machine. And so you have these novice users who've never necessarily made machines before, and they kind of go straight to five-axis control because they don't necessarily know about all of the historical limitations that we originally had with figuring out how to do one, two, three, four, five-axis. Precision ketchup dispensing, obviously from Japan. <laughs> um, this is a cocktail mixing robot. And so this is a one-week assignment in the class. And so if you think these are all frivolous machines that novices can make in a one-week assignment, then using these kinds of infrastructures, what are the kinds of machines that we can make in uh, factories or even in uh, where you're doing diagnostic testing for hospitals? Another Japanese machine for cutting zucchini. They managed to get all the control system to work very well, but then they weren't able to attach the knife very well. <laughs> but this is another hot end machine. And then uh, there, were a lot of, there were a lot of drying machines. And one thing that I thought was kind of cool 
Was there a people that would draw with the drawing machines the plans for the parts to make more machines? So the drawing was a, was a way to also get more precision throughout. Um, this is a precision uh, bleach dripping machine. So they're doing selective dyeing of t-shirts with bleach dripping. Uh, and then two, two different fab labs, one in... Uh, one in Ohio and one in Italy, both made sand gardening machines. And so if we've made it easy enough to make machines that we can make precision sand gardening machines, I think that we can really achieve the ultimate Zen uh, machine building experience. Um, and so this is, I'm, I'm sorry about all the technical difficulties and not leaving a whole lot of time for Q&A, but uh, this, is, uh, this is the end of my presentation or the things that I wanted to share with you guys. <laughs> so. Thank you so much, Nadia, and thank you all for your patience in the face yes. of tech thank adversity. Um, fortunately, we don't have time to do Q&A on stage. However, and I'm sure a lot of you have some like one-on-one -on -one questions that you'd like to ask. Do you have some time to stick around? Yeah, yeah I'll stick okay. around. I'm just going to get my backpack, and then I'll be over there. Perfect. So one more round of applause for Nadia, please. All right. And thank you all again for your patience. Um, she will join you stage side, and please feel free to come up and ask all the questions that you love to.